Chapter 16 looks at waste generation and waste disposal. Your textbook opens with an analyzing styrofoam versus um, a paper cup, and they're referring to it as, as a plastic here. So styrofoam, when you take into account all sorts of different factors, um, styrofoam, it, it minimizes the temperature change, it's light, it insulates, but it's made from petroleum, it doesn't decompose. Paper doesn't insulate as well, so it needs a cardboard sleeve in order to be able to hold it. Um, looking at this cradle-to-grave analysis, you're looking at both inputs and outputs related to manufacture, use, and disposal. If we look at other things, um, paper uses 2 grams petroleum plus 33 grams of wood, which is renewable, um, but it's also heavier, so it's heavier to transport if we're going to transport paper cups. It uses two times the energy and a lot more water. It can only be used once. It can be cycled, but both of them often end up in the landfill. Um, the paper cup will degrade and produce methane. Uh, the plastic cup or the styrofoam cup uses three grams of petroleum, so more than the two grams, but no wood. Um, it can be used more than once if people choose to do that, um, but it can leach chemicals. It won't degrade. Um, paper uses bleach to make and dioxin, which harms aquatic life. Incinerating both of them is, is sort of equal. In one study, it was found that plastic cups were better, um, but there's toxic emissions. And then you have to look at the exposures of the workers that are working on these things. Um, so we have to take into account science, ethics, judgments, um, and different inputs. It's not as clear-cut as paper versus plastic. It's a more complicated analysis. So what is, what is waste? Waste is outputs that include anything not useful or consumed and non-useful products generated within the system. Um, in most situations, the waste of one organism becomes the source of energy for another. Humans are the only organisms that produce waste that others cannot use. Um, your book also shows a picture of like a dung beetle that's going to use the waste of one organism. Until society becomes relatively wealthy, it generates little waste. So if we think about poor countries, they're going to use things over and over. All recycled, things like junk dealers, the bookcase will break. It will become the step stool, but it's no longer functional as a step stool. It's used as firewood. Um, Labor-saving household appliances, things like our, our dishwashers and, and things like that, were purposely designed so they would need to be replaced in a few years. And then we moved on to the habit of TV dinners and disposable napkins and plates and forks. And in the 1960s, the big one was disposable diapers. The U.S. leads this idea of a throwaway society. Municipal solid waste is what we're talking about, MSW. It's refused collected by municipalities from households, small businesses, institutions, such as schools, prisons, municipal buildings, and hospitals. Basically, it's the collection of garbage. Um, the EPA estimates that 60% of municipal solid waste comes from residences and 40% comes from commercial and institutions. In 1960, we generated 80 million metric tons, and then by uh, 2008, we were up to 232 million metric tons. Now, you have to keep in mind that our population is much larger, and it's due largely to population. In 2008, 4.5 pounds of municipal solid waste was generated per person per day in the United States. It varies by season, it varies by socioeconomic status, geographic location, and um, additional waste, agriculture, mining, industrial, and much of that is processed on site. Um, developing, developing countries are impacting municipal solid waste because they are producing more of the goods used in developed world. So they're manufacturing our products and shipping them over, and so they're generating more waste. Computers which were invented in the U.S. are made in Taiwan, Singapore, and Japan. And so there's a footprint that goes along with user and manufacturing. If we look at some um, other areas, Japan generates 2.4 pounds of waste per day. And so we're looking at um, almost double at 4.5 pounds. The developing world generates 1.2 pounds per day. And indigenous tribes only generate um, zero. They don't gen generate any. What are the contents of the solid waste stream? Um, so looking at this diagram here, um, use and then throw away organic items, fibers, metals, plastics. Um, waste is generated from manufacturing, packaging, and transporting. And the waste stream is all solid waste that is recycled, incinerated, um, or sent to the landfill. 
So the total waste is 254 tons that's generated for recycling. And if we look at some of these percentages, 31% um, of it is paper, newsprint, office paper, cardboard, box board. Ten years ago, it was 40%. Um, organic waste, about 26%. Wood and construction, about 7%. Um, 33%, all that could be um, composted. Um, then we look at things that are durable, things that last for years, versus non-durable, which are things that are um, disposable. Okay, so we have durable goods and non-disposable. And these are some of the statistics I gave on the previous um, page. 33% of our organic materials could be um, composted. We'll talk about that later. E-waste, or electronic waste, is small by weight, but it's important. It's TVs, computers, portable music, cell phones. It's only 2% of the waste stream, but it has a large environmental effect. Um, things like your um, cathode ray tube or TV or computer, it has 2 to 4 pounds of lead and mercury and cadmium that can be recycled, but there's little motivation to do so. You voluntarily have to recycle it. You can also just throw that in your, in your trash, even though you're not supposed to. It costs more to recycle those things. That's why a lot of times when you have electronics recycling, which is the quote-unquote right thing to do, it might cost money to actually have those things recycled. 18% um, of electronic waste is recycled, uh, but then it's exported to China, where adults and children separate with fire and acids, and they don't use protective gear, so there's a lot of controversy surrounding um, what is how the, that electronic waste is processed. Then we're going to move into this idea of reduce, reuse, and recycle, which we're pretty familiar with. Um, reduce is the number one choice. It's the optimal way to reduce solid waste, waste minimization, waste prevention. Less inputs equals less outputs. Um, let's reduce it at the source. Let's reduce in early stages of design, often increase energy efficiency. Um, might cost more up front. Might get a copy of that duplexes papers, um, and that might cost more up front, but we're going to use a lot less paper. We're reducing that. Uh, reducing packaging at the source. We used to have CDs, and they came in those, those clear cases. Then they moved to a cardboard model. And now most people just download their music, so the CDs are becoming obsolete. Um, you might think of things like workers using paper cups. Let's say a company uses paper cups every day, and instead they buy those workers um, a mug. And so there's things that you have to take into account. You have to clean that mug, so there's going to be energy that goes into that. There's the weight of transporting that mug, which is much more than the weight of transporting paper cups uh, for looking at like plastic versus ceramic. What is the break-even point? Do you have to use that mug 50 times before you break even with um, the paper cup? Um, Subaru is not sending any waste to landfills. That's pretty remarkable. This idea of reuse, reusing allows materials uh, to cycle longer before coming in output. Um, we put energy into repair and transport and cleaning and, and sterilizing things. So like cleaning and sterilizing glass bottles that are going to be used again rather than making new ones. And then recycle. Recycles are is is good, but you know, reduce and reuse is our best too. Recycle materials destined to become waste are collected and converted into raw materials. A closed loop, the product becomes the same product. So aluminum cans, we recycle aluminum cans to make more new aluminum cans. Or we have what's called an open loop. We take something like plastic soda bottles and we make polar fleece jackets. Or we take sneakers and we recycle them to make um, playground material. In the United States, we recycle one-third of our municipal solid, um, solid waste. Japan is 50% of their waste. Um, Zero-sort recycling is the idea that um, it's a sort of a single stream. We can put everything out together. Um, when I was young, you used to put the brown glass in one bin, the green glass in another, the clear glass in another, um, and then um, the plastic in another, paper in another bin. So we would have four, five, six, seven bins. Now we have a single stream. Um, there's more energy and time and processing and cleaning and transporting and modifying, um, but um, it, we make it easier. People are more likely to do it. And this is looking at percentage of municipal solid waste that is recycled. Composting is a, is a really neat idea. Um, compost is the last landfill diversion. It's more important because organic materials, food and yard waste, are unstable, so they decompose. But if that oxygen, then it's an anaerobic decomposition, which is going to make methane. 
um, it's more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, so we don't really don't want that happening. If we compost, organic matter is decomposed under controlled conditions to produce organic rich material that enhances soil structure, cation exchange capacity, and fertility. Vegetables um, are things that we want to compost, but we don't want to compost meat and dairy. Um, you need a good ratio of carbon to nitrogen, 30 to 1, 30 carbons to 1 nitrogen. It supports the best microbial activity. Uh, dry materials, leaves and cut grass supply a lot of our carbon. And then our kitchen vegetables will produce some nitrogen. And then we turn it to keep the process aerobic. Um, otherwise, we're going to generate methane and a bunch of odor. There's large-scale scale composting facilities, which is the same as household. They, you pick it up and, and it's... You, know, you can compost on, on a large scale, but you can also compost on a much um, smaller scale as long as you control the water, the ratio of carbon to nitrogen, the temperature, and the turnover. Um, and this is just looking at a large scale composting facility. You bring in this organic waste like this newspaper and leaves and food scraps and woody materials. Um, it's separated from anything that accidentally got in this non-compostable. It's removed and sent to the landfill. And then the compost compostable things are aerated and turned, and, and then it's transported and sent off for use. Landfills are also um, a big part of this chapter. So an open dump is still common in the developing world. It's essentially exactly what it is. You just dump your stuff there. There's no um, protection, which is different from sanitary landfills, which have protections in place. And leachate is what we're concerned about. Um, Leachate is the water that leaches through the solid waste and removes various chemical compounds with which it comes into, con into contact. Okay, so in 1930s we started as sort of these holes in the ground, aka a landfill, let's fill up these holes. Um, and so what we want to look at more closely is what's a sanitary landfill. What things go into design to make it sanitary? And here, looking at some of the things, one, you want to have some sort of clay or plastic lining at the bottom to protect that leachate from, from going in. Two, you want pipes below um, your landfill in order to collect any leachate that might have snuck its way through so it doesn't get into the water. Um, we do want to cover with some sort of soil or clay cap, okay, to keep it, um, you can keep it contained in there. You want to reduce the water inputs. Um, if more water is going to increase anaerobic respiration, it's going to lead to more leachate, it's going to lead to more methane. So you want to, you want to monitor um, that that there's only a certain amount of water getting in there. Um, you want good inputs, like composite materials, paper and plastic, um, metals are bad, um, toxic materials are bad, and organic things are bad because they're going to make methane. Our paper and plastic are sort of our you know, best things for our, our landfills. And then when it's closed, it's capped. The word is capped with soil or clay. Um, there's a tipping fee, so you pay by the weighted truckload. This is a certain price per ton, right? Right, you know, thirty-five dollars a ton. And choosing a site um, can be, you know, both political and, um, you know, things that you want to keep it. You want it rich in clay. You want it away from rivers and streams and water. You want it far from population, but not so far that you're spending too much money on transportation. The word siting is where you're figuring out where you're going to put a landfill. And it's often uh, controversial and political. This idea of NIMBY um, comes up all the time, not in my backyard. Yeah, I want a landfill and I want a place to put my trash, but I don't really want it near me. And then what are some of the problems with landfills? Um, before we get to incineration, some of the problems are locating landfills near populations that don't have the resources to object. Um, some of the problems is leachates contaminating water. The EPA estimates that all landfills have some leaching, no matter how careful we are. The risk to humans and water is uncertain. It's lower than climate change, but methane generated from landfills, and there's very little decomposition taking place in landfills. You need the correct mixture of air and moisture and organic materials. So a lot of times we thought this landfill would sort of go away, and um, and they don't. Okay, so we don't. They they're sort of staying there for good.